Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. Now we're going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the link to our sponsor, Miracle Made, in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, I first met Stephen Breyer more than 45 years ago when he was one of those extraordinary Edward M. Kennedy staffers. He was then working on airline deregulation. And I have been in awe ever since including his 28 years as a justice on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, welcome, Mr. Justice. We are so proud Thank you very to much. It's very nice. Thank you for the kind words. You have written a new book, Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. What, t- explain it, and what do you intend for this to convey to aspiring lawyers and concerned citizens? Well, what is a job? What's the job that the Supreme Court mostly does and appellate courts mostly do? When I have to explain that job to, say, a fifth grader, and I like to talk to fifth graders, they're fun. I say, I read, which is true in the newspaper, a professor of biology was traveling from Nantes to Paris. He had next to him a wicker basket, the conductor opened up the wicker basket and there were 20 live snails. The conductor says, have you bought a ticket for the snails? And he says, what are you talking about? A ticket for snails? I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, The conductor says, well, read the fare book. It says no animals on the train unless they're in a basket and then you have to pay half fare. He says, they're not talking about snails. They're talking about dogs or cats or, or maybe rabbits or something, but certainly not snails. You think they're talking about mosquitoes? I mean, that's ridiculous. So he says, well, what is an animal? Is it an animal or not? Is a snail an animal or is a snail not an animal? And he says, that's beside the point. So I say to the class, what do you think? I say to the fifth graders, what do you think? Does he have to pay the fare or not? And that, I don't have to say another word, not another word. They get into the most tremendous argument. Half of them say, yes, a snail is an animal. It has to pay. He said, no, they don't mean that. And I say, okay, I can go and I can just sneak out of the room and leave them to argue. I said, that's what judges do. They don't use snails, but the freedom of speech. Does that apply here? Doesn't it? What does it really mean? The right to carry arms. What does it really mean? They have to, just like the conductor or just like the professor, they have to figure out what those words in the Constitution or in a statute, what they mean, how do they apply? All right? So why write that since every judge knows that? Why write this book? Well, I think, as you can see, it's a rather hard question, maybe snails an animal. Is it an animal for purposes of the fair book or not? Is it obviously not, or what? Well, it used to be. In answering that kind of question, a judge might look at a lot of things. One, read the text. It says, animal, read the text. Hmm, hmm. Uh, If it says carrot, that doesn't mean a fish. Okay, I agree with that. But that isn't getting us very far. So judges used to look at a lot of other things. They'd say, someone wrote these words in the statute. Someone wrote this uh, constitution. And what did they have in mind? What was the purpose? What's the purpose of these words, okay? Or um, are there human rights involved? What are the values? Or uh, what are the consequences? Or uh, what was the history of the bill that became the law? Or, uh, and I could go on. But more recently, uh, in the 21st century probably, 
People came along who were judges or lawyers or law professors, and they said, you should just read the words, just the words, nothing else. And we make you four promises. One, if you just read the words, you'll get a simple answer. Two, if you just read the words, Congress will know better how to legislate. Three, if you just read the words, well, it will be fairer because all the responses and answers and interpretations will be the same. And if you just read the words, those judges will not be able to sue, substitute what they think is good for what is the law. So I wrote this book because, in my mind, too many people are accepting this uh, textualism or its cousin, originalism, which means what people thought the words meant uh, at the time they wrote this. You see the Constitution as a living document, adaptable to the times, uh, and um, the, the others, the originalists, uh, basically say that what they wrote back in, in the 18th century, uh, you just take it verbatim and it can be applied today, despite enormous changes. Is that a a fair summary? That is a fair summary. And I say, oh, I see. You go back to what the reasonable person thought the words meant in 1788 or 18, say, 69 or 70 after the Civil War, when the Civil War amendments were written. I see. You do that. You do that. Well, oddly enough, you know, the founders themselves, I mean... Chief Justice John Marshall, he said this, this document is meant to last for the ages and deal with problems only dimly seen. It's not just for the people who are now alive and participate in the political process. And by the way, do you know who did not participate in the political process? What percentage of the country do you think in 1789 did not participate in the political process. True. No women, no slaves, no non-property owners. It had to be very few. <laughs> That's right. And uh, there were no women there, absolutely, not the slaves. And that certainly was true of all these. So you're getting a rather limited version of what this political process was producing. And then Nino and I used to debate this all the time, Nino Scalia. We went to Lubbock, Texas. Good school. They've probably never seen a Supreme Court justice. And they may have thought it was a football game because they just about filled the football stadium. And what they would learn is that Nino Scalia and I were good friends. But they also learned we had very different points of view. Yeah. Now, I would try to make you know, your... One thing I love about this, about, about you and the Stephen, Stephen, is you keep sight, Casey, Casey, going back to John Marshall in current cases uh, and, and, and translate that into the points you're making. But in 2006, after a series of sweeping court decisions, you famously said from the bench, it is not often in the law that so few have so quickly changed so much. And two years ago, you reaffirmed that. And I'm just thinking surveys like the University of Pennsylvania's Policy Center find a dramatic shift in public attitudes towards the court. They say more people now see the court as politicians in robes. Is that attributable in part to those few who change so much so quickly? It's a, a lot in that question. When you write an article and you know that the person who is you're quoting has changed his view, to what extent do you put that in the article? Ah, do you think it depends on who the person is? Do you think it depends on the subject? I mean, the fact that there have been changes sometimes do call for changes in law, and sometimes they don't. And the discipline is not computer science. It isn't hard science. And what a judge is doing is trying to have a sensible interpretation of those words. What do they mean? And so there's no absolute answer to the kinds of questions you're asking. When Nino and I would debate, I would say, you know, it says the freedom of speech. George Washington didn't know about the Internet, did he? And Nino would say, I knew that. He said, but it's more like, I think he's right about this. He says, more like the two campers. 
one camper sees the other putting on his shoes, running shoes. Where, where are you going to put running shoes? Why? There's a bear in the camp. Really? You can't outrun a bear. Yeah, but I can outrun you. And what he would say about the ways that I use to interpret documents, constitutions, statutes, huh. he'd say they're complicated. You're the only one who could do it. And I'd say, but your way of interpreting the Constitution, you'd have a Constitution nobody wanted. And you have to look at the examples. You have to look through this book and see a lot of examples before you'll be willing to accept what I say or what he says. Yeah. And that's why I've written it this way. I want to stay on the court standing just for a minute, though, because this, this court was assembled legally, to be sure, but many think, in a way, illicitly, when Senator, Senate Leader McConnell <clears throat> decided for nine months to reduce the size of the court. He didn't even allow a vote on Merrick Garland, a Democrat. And then four years later, uh, he rather recklessly rushed through the nomination of a Republican, Amy Coney Barrett, in a matter of weeks before an election, having nothing to do with those two people, although it does have to do with McConnell. Doesn't this understandably make it harder to see these justices as judges and not politically motivated? I mean, um, there have been good judges and there have been bad judges and uh, whether they were delayed or not delayed, Brandeis' appointment was delayed a lot because there was anti-Semitism at that time and they didn't want a Jew on the court. But he was confirmed. He was eventually confirmed, correct. And uh, you can say, well, uh, what about politics? That's what you're getting at. And yep. I'll ask you this, politics in the court? And you're not the only one if you think it. I don't know if you do or not. It's all politics. It's all politics. Hmm. Is it? Is it? Do you want, what do you want public opinion to think? Suppose you, doesn't apply to you personally, but suppose you are a very unpopular person. Suppose you're accused of a crime or something bad. Suppose you're going to have a trial. Do you want that judge to be very sensitive to politics when he's ruling in your case, if you are an unpopular person? No. This document here, says Hamilton, is the same law for the most popular person in the country as for the least. All right. Now take the opposite side, which you were taking. Now take the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Paul Freund said the best thing about that. Great scholar, great constitutional scholar. He said, here's the relation of politics and the court. No judge, no judge properly, and we hope no judge at all, decides a case on the basis of the political temperature of the day. But all judges do and should take account the climate of the season. That's a great statement because nobody knows what it means exactly. But nonetheless, that's um, why it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But uh, you see, the New Deal Court, the country had changed a lot from the time 50 years earlier or 40 years earlier when the court had decided that Congress could not pass a min minimum wage law, maximum hour law. It had changed a lot. And the court changes somewhat with that. Now, what people think of, I, you're right, I did work for Senator Kennedy. Suppose you were working for Senator Kennedy. The phone rings. The phone rings again. Senator, I have two telephone calls for you, one from the Secretary of Defense and one from the Mayor of Worcester. Which one will he take first? Oh, Worcester, in a minute. In a minute. Of course he'll take Worcester. It's a constituent. You know, real politics, and in my experience there, is will the Republicans show up at the executive session? Is this popular or unpopular? Are you going to get more people? That does not exist at the Supreme Court. But I, I, what I'm saying here is not that they make political decisions. Merrick Garland did not get a chance to make a political or non-political decision because Mitch McConnell decided that there shouldn't be a Democrat on the court. And he decided in a matter of weeks 
before an election that there should be a Republican on the court. That's I know what you're saying, and I am purposely avoiding it. You're doing it very well, too. Uh, no, no. You know why I am avoiding it? Tell me. Because it's sort of ethical rule, but also a very practical rule. Keep judges out of politics. And I am a recently retired judge. And starting to criticize uh, something that's really the Senate's job, which you're free to criticize as much as you'd like. But for me to do that is just not appropriate because I have to decide the work product that they produce in the form of statutes. So well, I don't get into not. what you think. Now, it's like this. To decide, I was confirmed. It was, I was pretty nervous about it, too. But to talk about the confirmation process, well, from the point of view of the senator, that's what you're asking me. For the public, that's sort of like asking for the recipe from chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. You see? Uh, I, that's, that, that's something I can't really go into. Cause, I, cause, wish Mr. Mc, I, I wish Senator McConnell had, had, had read that book first, but I want to turn it over to James Carville. Uh, well, Justice Hopp, I had a touch of levity here. What did Stephen Barr, James Carville, and Adolf Hitler have in common? <laughs> um, I give I give up, maybe. Uh, we were all discharged as corporals. Really? Yeah. No kidding. I knew I, I probably knew somewhere Hitler was, and I guess I was. I yeah, according to the Wikipedia. Yeah, <laughs> in 1965. Yes. Yeah. And you were probably discharged as a corporal. Uh, well, I was specialist four or something. Well, it's the same thing. It's an it equal. Is the same. Yeah, it'd be, it'd it be is exactly. But is anytime you want to strike up a conversation, sure. have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like so that. I like you're, that. You're I like, done? I you like that? I like that because I think it's a good idea that people are in the army for a while or the equivalent, you know, some kind of public right. service. Right, so right. I just, I just something about it. I just it just popped in my mind. So uh that's why you had a brother and y'all both served concurrently in the federal courts. Your brother was a federal district judge, he was yes, a Supreme Court judge. He is out in San Francisco. Does it what did it bother you at all that he had to live under a code of ethics that was pretty constraining and, and definitive and that you nope. had no code of ethics? Uh, two parts. One, no, it didn't bother me. Okay. Part number two, we do have a code of ethics. The I In any ethical question that came up, I, he has seven books, I think there were seven, of ethical things that are put out by the Judicial Conference. And if I had a tough uh, uh, ethical case, I'd go read those. And if I couldn't figure it out from those, I'd call up a, I'd call up a, uh, a specialist in ethics in the university and say, what do you think? And... Uh, uh, so I think, okay. I think the other judges did something. You, you, like that well, okay, I, I'm, you know, may it please the court, but Gee. Yana, we've seen instances with Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch where uh, you, you had an internal code of ethics, you would check with it. Oh, the you opinion of the court, the public opinion of court is deteriorating. And to the average person doesn't understand why there's no written parameters of a code of ethics for a Supreme Court. It is there. The seven volumes are there for every judge if he wants to use them. And by the way, my, my, my brother, who is a district judge, what they can do to him if he does something unethical, which he doesn't, except when he was four years old and used to throw uh, things at me in my crib or whatever. But, <laughs> but since then, he's reformed. Okay, so if he does something that he shouldn't, you can impeach the judge, but that's it. It says you serve during good behavior. Now, that's the same for all the judges. It's uh, federal judges. It's the same for all federal judges. It's not something special in the Supreme Court that I'm aware of. So, but the, the, the opinion of the Supreme Court has deteriorated rather noticeably. Does that bother Chief Justice Roberts? Does that bother Alito? Does that bother... Barrett or Kavanaugh, or to just say to hell, we've got a lifetime appointment. We don't really give a shit what the public thinks about it. No, they don't think the latter, of course. In my opinion, I can't see into their minds. But how do you think people felt? How do you think they felt about Dred Scott? How do you think people felt? There have been a lot of mistakes that the court made. The court, right. you know, I, I tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone I said this. But American institutions are not foolproof. 
They're sort of the best we can. And you will find, you will find flaws in one after the other. And you'll say, why did they do that? And the answer will be, maybe we didn't think hardly enough, or maybe we didn't, or maybe da, 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 da. But if you want perfection, I don't know where you're going to go. And it wasn't even when I was a corporal in the army. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> I, 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 all right, Justice, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm saying the opinion of the Supreme Court when I went to law school yeah. or even at the turn of this century was pretty high. It was not That's that no long. Problem. Hey, when I was a law clerk, you know what? Okay. That was 10 years after Brown versus Board had been decided. And right. it was only a few years. Uh, uh, it wasn't even the law yet, in a sense. It was the sense it was the law, but there were people all over the South. You remember impeach Earl Warren? I, 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 you remember I those signs I, going up I, everywhere? Again, you remember I, Little Rock. I, 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 I just will say, sir, that the opinion, the confidence in the Supreme Court has deteriorated in this century. I, I, I don't think, I, that, that, I think that's a fact. And, I, and one of the things that I believe, I think that we have now accepted the fact that with the exception of Barrett, who went to Notre Dame, everybody on the Supreme Court went to an Ivy League school. No one ever ran for sheriff. Okay. And do you think there's any value in having one or two politicians on the court that maybe have a lived experience sometimes that people like people for most of the time in the judiciary don't? Yes. Okay. Well. I got you to agree with something. <laughs> I, look, if I didn't agree with you a lot, why did I write this book? In writing this book, I'm saying what is not pure politics, but right. it is what they decide on the basis of. And there are a lot of people, hey, what do you want? Let me see. I wrote this down, page 60. This is good. One of the textualists on the court says, you have to look at the original public meaning of the words. And Nino used to say, we look for meaning in text. We say that text means what it meant when it was written. And we reject any speculation about the drafter's extra, extra textually derived purposes or consequences. And I say that's just what I don't think. But I think the way to go about changing it, which I'd like to do, is to sit down and write something and maybe they'll read it or maybe they'll hear about it and maybe they'll see why I think that's such a bad way of going about, of going about trying to interpret statutes or the constitution. We have here a document. This document is based upon things like a democratic system, human rights, Equality, rule of law, separation of powers. There are principles in this document. And when you interpret it, I think, and it's not an easy thing to do, you've got to look at those principles and you don't want the kinds of interpretation that's going to weaken them. And to explain what I've just said in two sentences, unfortunately for the possible reader, would require them to spend quite a lot of time seeing what I mean in practice. Go read, go read the gun case. They say, I'm not supposed to look. I'm not supposed to look at the actual facts about guns, at the actual consequences when we have 400 million guns in the United States. 400 million, we're number one. I think Yemen is number two. I'm not supposed to look at that? Are you kidding? You didn't say that. But that kind of thing is what the textualists think. I say, please, please, go look at the number of people. You know, when the first, it was only recently that people began to have mass killings, but when they began to have mass killings, boy, they really did it. I mean, they're all over the place. And they weren't 100 years ago. And so I say, you don't want me to look at that? You want me to look at what? You want me to look at the history? The history of what? The history of arms? Am I supposed to look back to the Hundred Years' War? They had, did you know they had halderbirds? <laughs> did you know they had still ladders? Did you know they had Asian fire, which you threw over the roof? And now you tell me I'm supposed to look and see what that bears today uh, to having a gun law against concealed weapons or carrying open weapons in New York? Please, please, I'm not a historian. Do you see the point there? 
I, I see point of four turns out. What would they say if you ask Justice Scalia? What what is it meant by a well regulated militia, and why is that stuck in the middle of all of this? What does it? What would a, an originalist or a Texas say about that? What he did say. What he did say is, a, it says, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What he did say was the right of the people to keep and bear arms is in a separate clause from a well-regulated militia, so it doesn't have to do with the well-regulated militia. What John Stevens said was that uh, Madison and the others were pretty worried uh, about this getting ratified, this document. And one of the arguments against it was, if you regulate, if you ratify this document, New Hampshire or Massachusetts or Delaware, you're going to see in Article 1, it says Congress can call up the state militias that just won the war for us, and they could disband them. That would be terrible, Madison says. Never fear. Never fear. I will put in the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment will say to Congress, you can't disband the militia. See, I won. You don't have to worry about it. Got it. And that's what John Stevens said. And uh, I agreed with John Stevens. But there were only four. There were only four. So now you have the historical argument that went on, conducted by nine people who are not historians. Okay? You wanted to know. You're the one who asked the question. I am. I'd like to bias the Supreme Court. I expect to get an answer. <laughs> well, you got an answer. But that's what it was. There were, there were different views. That's what they said. And by the way, oh, this is interesting to me. <laughs> it's interesting. Might be to you. In the, in, in the last case, a bunch of sort of linguistic historians wrote. And they wrote and told us that between 1760, I think, and 1780, they found about 120,000 references, maybe 160,000, to the words bear arms, okay? And almost every one of those referred to a militia, not to hmm. the right to carry a gun under your pillow. Now, that's the kind of wow. thing that interests the judge, you see, but <laughs> particularly in history, I don't guarantee that... Uh, it's of interest to you, but I, I think right. it's yeah, I think it is. a great yeah, interest. I, 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 wish those, I wish those other judges had, uh, right. had read that. You know, Mr. Justice, you took issue with me one time when I referred to it as the Republican court. Um, and, and I know that that displeases you. Yet every major decision in the last 20 some years, Bush v. Gore, the Heller gun decision, Citizens United, Shelby County, gutting voting rights, Roe v. Wade, the affirmative action at, at Harvard, ending affirmative action uh, at Harvard University in North Carolina. These are all out of the GOP playbook and all have been celebrated by Republicans. So oh. why am I so wrong to call it a Republican court? Now, that's sort of a political question, which I probably shouldn't answer, but I think I will. <laughs> the, 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 what you have not taken into account is Roe v. Wade was written by a person, a judge who was appointed by a Republican. You have not taken into account... Different that, Republicans back then. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think okay. okay, you have not taken into account the fact that John Stevens and David Souter, the two people who probably I agreed with the most, and Sandra O'Connor, and certainly those three, and except for Ruth, Ruth was appointed by a Democrat. But Ruth and I were the only ones appointed by a Democratic president. Sandra, Tony, uh, David Souter... Uh, uh, John Stevens, they were all appointed by Republican presidents. And uh, probably if you go and look and see, that's, I was more often, when, the, when we were split, we're only split 5-4, we used to be in about maybe 15, 20% of the cases, probably about oh, 40, 50% were unanimous. But look, there wasn't split Republican-Democrat. It was uh, Republicans here and the Republicans there. Do you think that's true today? Is that true today? They're more, more appointed by Democratic uh, uh, presidents today, uh, Sonia uh, Sotomayor and Lena No, Kay. but what, I, I think what you're saying is even though they were reported, uh, appointed rather, by Republicans, uh, it didn't take a political coloration when they were on the bench. They, uh, you know, no, one gets the impression that that's different today. I want to lead you away from this. 
Okay. Why? No, no, no. You know, I mean, you uh, because I'll, I'll give you an answer, but it's going to take a minute. Okay. All Go right. Ahead. I'm trying to get Republicans to get to the exec when I'm working in the Senate. That is a political job. Hmm. Yeah, more than you might think. Or are you popular, Senator Kennedy? Are you unpopular? Da, 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 da. Okay. Now, do I see that in the Supreme Court? No. What do I see? Now, you might say this is a difference without a distinction, but what do I see? Political groups do try to get appointed a person whom they believe will decide things more in their favor. They're sometimes wrong, but sometimes right. But the person, the judge, doesn't think he's doing it on a political basis. He thinks he's doing it because that's the way the law should be. Okay, got it? He thinks he's deciding according to law. And that's why I wrote this thing. I wrote it the way I did, because I want to convince him he's not. All right? That's one. Two, have you ever tried political science, political philosophy? It bears a resemblance to politics, but it isn't politics. Three, do you think you are affected by where you grew up? Do you think that our colleague here <laughs> was affected by being a corporal in the United States Army? Yeah, he was. And uh, so was I. Do you think I was affected by going to Lowell High School in San Francisco, a public, good public school? Do you think I was affected by my father working for the school board? Do you think I was affected by living the life I have? Yeah. Do you think you can just get rid of that when you're on a court and a judge? You can try, and people do try, but you can't get rid of it completely. You're affected by your background. That's three. Four, it's what Paul Freund said. Paul Freund said, no judge is affected by the temperature of the day, but they're all affected by the climate of the era. That's why the New Deal court changed. Five, you have real politics. Where? I think it was real politics when Frankfurter told the court, don't decide the miscegenation case now. The South is bad enough at the moment. They won't do it. Let's wait for a while. Now, that's politics. And they did wait, and they did eventually decide it in favor of uh, uh, the civil rights side. With a bunch six. of elected politicians six. making that decision. Yeah, yeah I'm not against that. I'm not against that. I know you're not. Six, no, no, you, you've written yes. that, as a right. matter of fact. Yeah, right. Right. Six, right. six, and this is where the toughest one is, and you may get an answer. Read what President Taft, when he was Chief Justice, wrote to Justice Sutherland. He said this. He said, of course I would like to appoint it to the court. Someone who's knowledgeable as a judge. But I'd also like that person to know something about what he called the higher reaches of politics. Because the court is not just an ordinary institution like another court. It has something special about it, being part of one of three branches. And what that special thing is and when it appears and how it appears, I call X. I call X because I don't know quite how to describe it. But when you started out with your initial question, isn't this all just politics? Which was not your question, but close enough. My instinct is to say no. And when you say, well, then politics has nothing to do with it. Huh? I say, no, that isn't quite right either. And then you ask me, will you describe what is right? And I say, X. And I've only been there 28 years. So I ought to do better than X. But I can refer you to Taft's letter. And uh, what it is exactly, and beware of it, beware of thinking that you don't want any. Maybe we'd still be a segregated country. Ha! Huh. Beware of thinking that you want too much. An unpopular person wouldn't get a fair trial. Beware of thinking too much, too little. And that's why Holmes and Cardoza and Brandeis and the judges I really respect, they write things that are a little hard to understand. But it's something to do with experience, something to do with understanding the country, something to do with understanding the basic rules of legal interpretation and also understanding, well, there are no rules. Ha, huh, there aren't? Well, well, well. Okay, that's why you get this wishy-washy, uncertain, indefinite answers. Because like you in journalism or elsewhere, for all of us, we've lived the life we've had, we've been affected, we don't quite know how, and we just do our best drawing on that experience as we go along. 
Mr. Jim, so I'm going to try one more and then turn it over to the corporal, uh, the the other corporal. That is, I know you would never comment. You would never comment on a current case, and I wouldn't ask you to. So I'm not asking you to comment on the case. But there are a number of of of, of lawyers and and Supreme Court former clerks who have complained that this court is slow walking the Trump uh, immunity case and almost assuring there can't be a trial before the election. This court sometimes can move with great, great speed. Uh, I mean, do, do, do you have any, is that criticism that they're slow walking it strike you as unfair? That goes right into the area of called politics that I shouldn't discuss, but I can do this. I can tell you the closest I can come. Okay. When I get this question, we're back at the fifth graders. I often, or college students, I'm more likely to get this from college students. And they say, well, what can we do about this country at the moment? And I say, well, you know, I don't have the answer to this question. You're the ones. It's your country. You'll have to decide, but I can tell you this if it helps. When I worked for Senator Kennedy, he made sure that his staff knew the following point. Credit is a weapon. Don't worry about it. You're having a hard time getting a bill through that I want, or you want, or do this or do that, and there's some opposition. John Stuart Mill said, I don't know if he knew that or not, go find somebody. Lincoln said this, too. He said about the same thing. Go find somebody who really disagrees with you and go talk to them. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't talk to them. Listen. Listen. Get them to talk. And when they talk enough, you'll find something that you actually agree with. And when they say that, you say, oh, what a good idea you have. What a good idea. Let's work with that. And sometimes when you work with that, you get somewhere. And by the way, if you get 30%, take it. Don't hold out for 100% of nothing, where your supporters normally will say, oh, what a hero you are. That's not what you want. You want to get somewhere, and 30% is fine. 20% may be fine. So get it. And then when the press, that's you, <laughs> and when uh, or both of you come in and say, Senator Kennedy, you did such a good job getting this bill. He'll say, and I heard him say it dozens of times, he'll say, don't congratulate me. Orrin Hatch came up with the idea that allowed us to get together. Okay? Credit is a weapon. If you succeed, there's plenty of credit to go around. And if you don't succeed, huh, who wants the credit? That was the brilliance of Senator Kennedy. There's no question. I want and, it's, and I say that to these students. And I'll right. tell you, I look at them when I say it, as you do when you look at somebody, when you're talking to a group, and you want to see if they're taking it in. And they are. Because they want something to do that is going to help this nation to get together. And I say, if you don't believe me, you don't have to believe me. But during COVID up in Cambridge, they had groups going around seeing if old people were okay, see if they had enough food. And I think that's true in St. Louis. I think it's true in, in you name the city. Because Americans are not so bad at finding projects and getting together. We learned that in my school, fifth grade, Miss Guataguatza, have four students and they get one grade. Ha <laughs> ha. You better pay attention to what the other three are thinking. And uh, so that's something we can do. So you get out there and don't just sit around and whine about it. You get out there and find people who disagree and listen to them and see if you can't get together. And that's the best I can do. And the rest is up to you. I'll, start, I'll try to stop whining and turn it over to wrap this up to Marine Corporal uh, James Carver. <laughs> oh, well, that was much better. He skipped out Marine because Marine, Marine really means something. I mean, yeah. It's really, uh, you know, corporal's a corporal, by any other word, is still a corporal. So I want to ask you a final question about status. So I was a corporal. If I see General Milley, who's retired, four-star general, I'm reminded of the story. It happened, but it didn't happen often, but Eisenhower one time did not salute back. And they asked him, why not? And he said, because I'm not an army anymore. Okay? That, so General Milley and Corporal Carver, we have the same rank now, civilian. All right? You are a retired Supreme Court justice, yet from your conversation, you feel like you operate under certain constraints because of 
your prior status. What, are, what, what, what kind of constraints are I'm, retired justices under? I'm, I'm a judge. If you take senior status, you remain a judge. And not only do you remain a judge in terms of status, but probably next fall, I will go over and sit with the First Circuit. Uh, so, so I'm still an active judge. Uh, okay, I just all right. I just, I, I, so you still can, you know, in Louisiana, I could be appointed municipal court judge for one month. in the rest of the you have to call a judge. But you still... I don't care what you call. Of, look, I don't care what people call me. I, I, I understand. You're that. saying, do I have to, do I have to follow uh, the, the ethical rules of being a judge? By and large, I think I try to oh, answer okay. the question. Yes, so, you, you, you still have status as a judge. You still status. Feel look, I'll tell you a secret. A president, and I'm not going to say who it is, but he said these words: um, "Hey, you'll discover the applause dies very fast, <laughs> and then you are left with the job." So you better like the job. Right. And the job is a job that is the privilege of being on the Supreme Court or any court. You have to give your all. You have to give what you think is best in you to deciding this case. And like a doctor, you don't just say, oh, gee, I've seen this disease so many times. I really don't give a damn about that patient. No doctor says that. And judges don't either. Those cases mean something to the people involved. And so you pay attention. Now. Why do I behave like a judge? I'm still a judge, and I still will have some of those cases. I, I did not realize you still heard cases, but then thank you for the explanation. Well, we, we, we have certainly learned a lot today. We've been uh, uh, properly uh, not, not, not <laughs> chastised, but you just you no. know, pointed us in, 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 in the right direction. You we, want to know where I wrote this book? I wrote this book as... I can't explain very clearly everything really in 20 minutes or 25 or half an hour. And what I'm trying to do is get a person who's not a judge, but interested, to read enough of these examples so that he sees what this job is like. Do I think it always works perfectly? Of course not. If I thought that, why would I have written this book? Well, everybody out there ought to get it because uh, I think that the justice has made an excellent point. It's, it's called Reading the Constitution. And you'll see why uh, he is not uh, an originalist. And uh, he makes a very, very persuasive case. Yep. Uh, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, thank you yeah. so much for being with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. I'm going to look for the book at the airport. I got a long flight ahead of me. And I, I, I'm actually looking very much forward to reading it, Justice. Let me know if they have it at the airport. I don't, <laughs> admit, admit, I don't think it's a W.A. Johnson <laughs> specialty, but they might if why they do. It? It why is it? <laughs> Say, right. right. hey, listen, awful good talking to you. Uh, Thank you. The Thank book you. is fascinating. And um, every time I'm around you, I learn a lot. Going back to airline deregulation in 19... 19- you want to know something about that, which I just thought of the other day when I flew to Chicago? Do you remember <laughs> Andy Devorney? If I say the words Andy Devorney, do you remember who that was? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you do? See, in every industry I learned, there's one person who really knows the industry. And... Uh, Andy Devorney knew the airline industry. He was never president. Uh, he was vice president at United. And he said, if you go ahead with airline dereg, we're canceling 300 routes. So we said, we're going out to see those routes. We're going to go. So we sat down with him in Chicago for route by route. No, it wasn't 300 routes. Maybe it was five or something. So we said, we'll put in a subsidy. He says, you know, Stephen, I think I'm the only one in this industry, which he was, who understood what, prayer, what, what price competition would mean. And he says, I've come to the conclusion that you're right. We will have airline dereg. We will lower the price. And the prices, by the way, in real terms are lower than they were in 1975. We will lower the price. We will fill up the airlines. And boy, you look at those airplanes. They are full. He says, we'll lower the price. We'll bring the people who can't afford it into the airline. They will be absolutely full. And you, Stephen, will hate it. <laughs> How about your boss? How did he like it? We didn't discuss it. After. Oh, no, for a while, we're great. It, it works fine. It's just that it's not very pleasant for the people who used to be able to afford the high prices. Right. Stephen Breyer, uh, it's, it's wonderful talking to you. 
And uh, uh, everybody, make sure you get that book, Reading the Constitution. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Take your bedroom game to the next level with Miracle Made Sheets. Let me tell you, it's really, uh, really effective too in getting a good night's sleep. I, I can just say I'm traveling, I don't have them, and I can tell the difference. I don't know, maybe I can pack them in my suitcase or something. <laughs> but they're, they're very, very effective. Sure are, because sleeping at the right temperature is one of the most important ways to feel rested the next day. Uh, we used to struggle with sleeping too hot. We found a way to sleep in perfect comfort all night long using NASA-inspired silver-infused bed sheets by Miracle Made. Their self-cleaning, antibacterial, eco-friendly bedding prevents 99.7% of bacteria and requires three times less laundry because they stay fresher three times longer. Now, you'll stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores and cause breakouts and acne. So sleep clean with Miracle. And trust us, with no more gross odors, life's going to be a lot easier on your spouse. That's because they use temperature-regulating silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA for maximum comfort. They make pillowcases and comforters, too. Imagine getting better sleep every night. Even better, Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice or even nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. You'll feel like you're on vacation every time you get into bed. Where are you going to imagine you're sleeping when you're under Miracle sheets? So try miracle.com slash to try Miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo, War Room, at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Now, listen to this. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com com slash war room and use the code war room to claim your free three piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's try miracle.com slash war room to treat yourself. Thank you. Miracle made for sponsoring this episode. You also can find the link in our show notes. James, uh, Israel killed top Iranian officials um, in D Damascus. Uh, it was a targeted attack, effective, a key objective. I'm afraid more important in the longer run will be, and more harmful, was that the Israelis killed seven World Central Kitchen workers bringing food to starving people in Gaza. Netanyahu said it was a mistake, an accident, the fog of war but it's going to only accelerate the anger and opposition to the Israeli carnage in Gaza. It's going to do it in the region, around the world, in America, and in Israel. Uh, obviously, you know, we both agree, Israel had to respond to the October 7th terrorism of Hamas. But now it's becoming counterproductive. Bibi says he wants to wipe out Hamas, and while he certainly crippled their war-making capacity, he's not going to eliminate them. And think of all the 8 and 10 and 11-year-olds who watch their innocent parents or grandparents or siblings wiped out by Israeli bombs who are future terrorist recruits. You know, the final point, James, um, the hostages are a huge deal in Israel. There are massive demonstrations. We don't know how many are left, probably as many as 100 or more than Hamas is outrageously uh, keeping captive, but they are never going to get home safely, never and alive, as long as Netanyahu keeps up these attacks. Well, I talked to a lot of people, and no one has any idea how to end this thing. I mean, there's no, Netanyahu does not have public support in Israel, but this war 
has overwhelming public support. But um, you know, people say, when we get the hostages back, you, they're not going to give you those hostages back without some staggering, staggering concessions. I don't think they're willing to make that. And I, 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 this is, I've never seen a, a conflict more depressing in many ways than this. That because I, I, I just don't see how it ends. I, I, I guess maybe you, the grand deal, you know, the, you put buffer zones and two-state solutions and massive aid to Gaza. And I, I don't know. I said, somebody, just anybody, please, someone, just tell me how this thing can possibly end. Because no one's been able to tell me that. Well, I think you've laid out as as good of the bad solutions as as might be possible. You're right. They're going to have to, Israelis, to get those hostages back, will have to make huge concessions. Not only are they going to, you know, stop the war right now, but they're going to have to release a whole lot of uh, Hamas prisoners, many of them terrorists. They've done that before. They've done that before in a 5, 10 to 1 ratio. They're going to have to do it again. But right now, you're right. There is support. There's no there's no support for Bibi in Israel, and there is support for the war. It's lessening. The demonstrations are increasing. The hostage issue is becoming central, uh, and I think that there's there are indications of splits within the cabinet he's put together. Uh, I you know I suppose he he wants to out of jail, uh, James. So so he'll take this thing as long. As um, as he has to, but boy, I, I I think it's just getting worse by the day. You know, and I, we're against the clock here because the Democratic Convention, I think, is early August in Chicago. Right. And we don't want to think about this if this thing is still going on. I mean, in the one thing, U.S. politics, it is being characterized by many people as. Muslim U.S. citizens and Ivy League students, it's way deeper than that, way deeper than that. In fact, it is so deep that the Israelis sent an emissary, a right-wing, you know, Netanyahu guy to see Trump. Trump told them they had the end of the war. <laughs> and I, they thought they had the greatest friend in the world, Donald Trump. He, he won't fool with this either. This is how bad it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. There's no... I had a... One of my former assistants who's, you know, utterly brilliant, has family in Israel, is not is a definitely a Democrat, definitely a left of center Israeli family, and they don't want to stop till it till Harash is right. I mean, it's clear to me that a lot of people want this thing to go on. Well, I, I, as I said, I, I hear that's beginning to change. I mean, still there, but it's beginning. Those demonstrations are massive, and they oh. are about getting the hostages out. And James, well, Andrew, I have to do you a don't lot get the hostages out as this thing goes on. That, that's a huge issue in Israeli politics. It was a huge issue at, at the end of the last century when I was there, and that is the Haredim, if you would think of the Orthodox, kind of a sect of Judaism, and they don't serve in the military. Right. And it is a sore spot in internal Israeli politics that is difficult to overstate. And that's the one thing that could screw Netanyahu's coalition up. And it that, could. that's a good, although I guess, as I, you may know more about this than I do, but the court has ruled that this, this exemption and these benefits uh, end uh, unless the Knesset uh, passes a law to extend them. And which there probably are not the votes to do that, because some of Bibi's, you know, less orthodox. So I, I don't know what happens. My guess know. is, my guess is that the crazies will stay in there because they're better off being inside, even if they lose their, their. Uh, and, you know, but I don't know that. it's a, it, it's not just a connected pressures. It is an enormous domestic issue in Israeli politics. It always has, and. You know, BB between that and the settler party, you know, but, but this is it's gonna, it's gonna take some maybe he's a surviving po politician if there ever was one. Let's see what he does, but it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a hard problem, James. Let's turn home. I know you want to talk about the Wall Street Journal poll, which is 
bad news uh, for Joe Biden. Uh, so go ahead. I, I don't really, I mean, just to say that there was this kind of false spring we had. And I mean, the, the, the best is that we've hit, we've not going any, any further down, but we're not in a favorable place. It, nothing really to say the union being great trumps every kind of freaking thing can happen to somebody, the, the, the fundraiser, the whatever, but it, it, it just doesn't move. And hopefully, to, you know, hopefully it does watching any indication, any, any tissue to hope yeah. and people have them. And then this was just a kick in the gut. But I'm not surprised. I, I mean, I talk to people, you know, I can't tell me you've got doctors in Poland all the time. And they don't see it getting better either. But, uh, you know, then the young numbers are are, are just are, are horrific. And it, I, somebody has got to think of something the way to re-engage young people. And the black numbers are horrific. And uh, I, we got to think of something. Well, I have a slightly different. I, I don't I certainly don't dismiss the Wall Street Journal poll, although it. it, it Clearly, it's no longer the gold standard it once was when Peter Hart and Bob Teeter were doing it, but still, it's a decent poll. But there are a few others out this week. Maris and Morning Consult that actually show Biden with a slight lead. That's two ways, though. Look, I think seven months out uh, in a three- or four-way race, is, which is what it's going to be, Trump starts with a small advantage, unquestionably. There are several potential altering events. I think, first, there's almost nothing almost nothing Biden can do uh, to improve his position by himself. Just, you know, don't fall and wage some effective attack ads. I think, however, it may be different with Trump. He's acting crazier and crazier. He again called undocumented workers animals. James, this is an aside. This is the guy, Donald Trump is the guy who makes fun, makes cruel fun of people with disabilities or who stutter. And his son, a little Donnie, uh, when John Fetterman, who had suffered a stroke, was elected to the Senate, uh, said the Democrats had just sent a vegetable. I mean, these, these are the people who behave like animals. But I think, you know, Trump is getting crazier and it's conceivable he'll go beyond the pale. Secondly, the Manhattan trial, if he's convicted, he is a criminal. He is a convicted criminal. We have all said it's not as big as the others, but it's also not irrelevant. And thirdly, watch the money. I noticed the guy who is bailing him out for the bond there, uh, who I'd never heard of, a California, I believe, he made his money by by um, uh, charging high interest loans to low income car buyers. Boy, that sounds like a Trump person, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I find it hard to see how Biden can win. I don't find it hard to see how Trump can lose. Well, I'm just going to move on to Wall Street Journal poll. The, the Democrat side is Dave Bostian. I know, know him. He's like a 180 IQ guy. He's with Gerstein's firm. He, there is no more competent poster. The poster is as competent as Dave, but they're none more competent. Now, I can personally attest to that. And who is the Republican poster? It was Fabrizio, who yeah. I... Well, I'll to, take but, Bob T. I'll tell you what, I'll take Bob Teeter. Well, I, you know, we don't have Bob Teeter. So, but I'm right. just telling you, Dave Boston is, 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 is as good a I, Dave Boston is as good a post as you can be in a Democratic Party. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak for the Republican side, but I mean, I'm not saying it's equal. Anything. I'm just saying it, I know this. I have every confidence if he put his name on it. That's a competently taken poll. That's all I'm saying. I didn't say it wasn't. I just said I know. It, I, let, know let's, I just said it wasn't right, the gold standard. Right, but in any I, event, we can. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, we can. Can move on. Hey, James, now for the outrage of the week. This was a battle of class and contrast. The uber-rich governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, with his vacation homes in Jackson Hole in Texas and 13-acre estate in Great Falls versus Louise Lucas, who was a single mom who worked in a shipyard and worked and saved 
her money to graduate cum laude from college. Lucas now chairs the powerful Finance and Appropriations Committee in the Virginia legislature. Youngkin, smarting for a success after his party suffered rejections in last year's legislative elections, settled on a $2 billion taxpayer-financed measure to bring the Washington professional basketball and hockey franchises to Northern Virginia. He figured he could bulldoze it, bulldoze and wheel and deal this through the legislature. Lucas, the former first female steam fitter, wasn't about to be rolled by some elitist former private equity guy. She deep-sixed the measure, saving taxpayers millions and Northern Virginians from traffic congestion hell. Everything ended well. The teams will stay in Washington. Professional basketball is an urban, not a suburban sport. Virginia taxpayers and commuters are off the hook. While, and while Yunkin is throwing a temper tantrum, maybe he'll learn you don't mess with a former steam fitter. Senator Lucas is my hero this week, James. Yeah, but the one thing that Ted Leonis has accomplished, he got Washington in the game. <laughs> and yeah. They're going to they're gonna spend a whole lot of money, but uh, I think it, it ended well for uh, Washington sports. Prior to the LSU UCLA basketball game, the Los Angeles Times, a very coastal, trendy, whatever the fuck they are, wrote a piece by a reporter named Ben Block, I think, saying it was good versus evil. It was milk and cookies versus dirty debutantes. He called the LSU women's basketball team dirty debutantes. If you don't know what that refers to, that is the title of a porn movie. To be fair, after 12 hours, they took it down. If anybody wants to know why the rest of America hates coastal elitism and coastal judgmentalism, you saw it right there, in, just right in front of your goddamn eyes. And who, somebody edited it, somebody okayed it, somebody left it there, and then it took them 12 hours to take it down. And this is the kind of stuff that cost us day in and day out in, in this whole condescending cosmopolitan attitude is death to Democrats and is death to people that are trying to win elections in the rest of the country. James, I totally agree. It was an absolutely outrageous article. Um, but then fortunately, a couple of days later, we saw one of the great basketball games it was. you'll ever see. It was the women's basketball game between LSU and, uh, and Iowa Angie Reese against Caitlin Clark, two of the great, greatest college players ever to play the game. It's it just, I mean, I went and I turned it on at uh, I, I, eight o'clock, whatever time it was, 730. And I, I, I didn't get up to go to the bathroom. It was so good. Uh, I mean, it was unbelievable. Angie Reese had a little bit of an ankle injury, but she played a great game. Caitlin yeah. Clark, you know, I've, never seen, I've never seen a, I, I think she can pass as well as any, any professional. I, I couldn't agree. I thought, I, look, I, and I'll say this, as big a fan as I am, we got beat. I, there's no, and we got beat by probably the greatest player in history of women's basketball. I don't know. It certainly would be in the conversation. Uh, but I think it was good to sport. It was 12 point, 12 and a half million people watched that. That's more than the men's finals, more than the World Series. I mean, the, the, the way that these, the whole women's sports thing is growing is unbelievable. I'm going to tell you the next one. The gymnastics is going to start to pile up some really impressive numbers. I, I, I'm not going to stay up for two hours watching gymnastics. But. You, you know, I, if I would have said, I would have said five years ago, I wouldn't stay up to watch women's basketball. Oh, I don't know, no, no, no. Okay. You All right, I'm not. Gonna, I'm, 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 I'm telling you, gymnastics. I mean, be it, it's just gotten too. better, but it was, it was there. Yeah. Now, I, what I'm really <laughs> waiting to see is if Purdue and UConn get in the men's finals. They have to both win. Uh, on Saturday. I want to see how that ratings compares to LSU, uh, Iowa. I, I, I thought it was going to be better. I'm not sure it's going to be. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I guess in the men's, I, I'm kind of pulling for North Carolina State. I just love the story and I love it. I don't, you know, got good. It's, it's a better story than anything else, but I, I suspect that UConn might be that good. <laughs> I don't know that. Well, they are, and the big guy, you know, the big guy from 
uh, Purdue, Eddie, seven feet yeah, four. They all said, yeah, they all said, you know, he didn't get recruited by a lot of schools. They said he's too slow. Well, I don't know how fast he is, but he's pretty goddamn <laughs> pretty unstoppable. Good. We'll see. So it'll, it'll, I think we got a good up. tournament coming up, though. It does. Yeah. It is. And we, and we got a great women's tournament. I mean, South Carolina yeah. and UConn and <laughs> Iowa. Wow. I mean, that's some real, real teams in there. No? Oh. Great. I wish we would have, but we're not. But no we got problem. lead eight, so that's not a bad year. Yeah. Yeah. Good basketball year. All right, James, now for our questions from the best listeners in America. I say that, and I really mean it, because, gosh, we get great questions. And we're going to start off uh, down under. Anna in Sydney, Australia, says, with Trump's cronies taking over the RNC, how long do you give it until they're in court over misappropriation of funds? Um, I guess it takes. Uh, a little while for in panel of grand jury, but I don't. I, I, it'll be before Labor Day. Yeah, we, we could we could start a pool on on what day. Uh, <laughs> you know, I might take I don't know August fifth, but uh, yeah, it's put a hope on it. Exactly, because that's yeah. what they do. But but you could say it might be August. You know, I'm going a little late. I'm going early September. Um. Mm-hmm. But maybe they have a thing that they won't announce an investigation 60 days before the election. But they're going to steal everything. And the def- if I were defending them, my defense would be you can't steal from someone who wants to be stolen from. I, if that, that, that's the um, re- remarkable thing about people that send Trump money. They know he's going to steal it. He d- steals it right in front of them and they keep sending him money. And my defense would be you can send it to be stolen from. You can't have a crime now. I don't know. I totally agree with you, but don't you think there are going to be some Republican state chairs and committee people and others and and candidates who who aren't going to be happy that the party is no longer the Republican Party? It is only by for Donald Trump. Well, can't tell you they're going to be happy or not, but they'd be scared to say anything. That's for sure. Because every one of them that says something, ask Liz Cheney, ask Adam Kinzinger, ask any of them, that's the end of you. Yeah. They understand this. It's it's hard to reconcile. That's what they want. They want to be stolen from. They want Trump to steal their money. And they're just going to keep sending it to him, and he's going to keep stealing it. Yep. It's that simple. I don't, don't ask me to explain it. And There, there is no... Republican Party, none. There's only Trump people. I mean, yeah, you got some re- retired people. I'm sure that you know Charlie Baker would say something, but it ain't be much. It ain't be much. Yeah. Well, right. you have the Bulwark people. They are former yeah, Republicans. They ain't Republicans anymore. And they, well, I know they are former Republicans, yeah. and they do great stuff every they single day. They do superb day, but, stuff. But, they, they, one of my favorite sites. Some of my best friends. But yeah. they're not Republicans. They'll no. tell you that. Right out to shoot. Right. And Alexandra was, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. <laughs> I love this question. Would the right. former senator from Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy, have strong opinions about the modern Republican Party? Or what would Joe McCarthy have to say uh, about the current Trump-dominated party? Joe McCarthy would come in loving this. He would love Trump's demagoguery. He would love Trump's meanness. I mean, he said, this is my kind of a guy. This is what I paved the way for. But you know what? Joe McCarthy would be a lightweight next to Donald Trump, and he would be brushed aside uh, in a matter of months uh, and be in the dustbin of uh, demagogic uh, history. Yeah, a Fayetteville, first of all, that's one of the more underrated places, uh, underappreciated places in the United States, the University of Arkansas. And it, Tremendous college baseball fans. In fact, we thought Wake Forest and LSU were the two best teams in the country. We both got swept last weekend. Unbelievable. North Carolina swept Wake Forest and Arkansas swept us. <laughs> Maybe one as good Man. as you thought. <laughs> it's what you call baseball, James. That is. That, that's the name of it. And boy, I tell you what, they are really fans in, 
at the University of Arkansas. I, I promise you, they're, they're as big as we are. Suey Pig. Yeah, yeah. Kevin in New Orleans. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I take it back, James. Kevin is from Orleans, Massachusetts, another okay. great place. Uh, and he, I guess he's questioning you. He said, is it not more, isn't it more important to focus on Trump's frightening comments on gun violence, family planning rights, abortion, and extending tax cuts for the rich rather, rather than to focus on his body odor? Um, I, there's a reason that I, we would say more important. Of course not. I, I think that mockery has its real place when it comes to Trump. And I think so much part of his image with his people is that he's a billionaire and he has, a you know, golden toilets and everything else. So am I telling you that saying that Trump stinks is more important than his criminality? No, but, you know, you got to have a little fun with the guy. And he does stink, but there's a lot of evidence man does stink. And people don't like stink. You know, they had a United flight in the bathroom overflow. They had to go back home because it stunk so much. And uh, I, I, I'm just going to stay on Trump stinking, but I, I appreciate the comment, but I'm not going to value things in rank of importance. But when it comes to Trump, anything that you can do to hurt him, I don't know how important it is, but it sure is fun. Uh, Gordon in Norwood, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's, uh, yeah, it's Ron Gordon, he gave his first name, thank you, Ron, in Norwood, uh, uh, Michigan, uh, says, uh, I would have preferred that President Biden step aside for a younger candidate. How much of his resistance to that idea do you think stems from the patronizing way he was treated by many Obama-era advisors? with more polished credentials. And I think that played a role. He was very resentful in 16, even though he really wasn't prepared to run given his son's death. He was very resentful that they all rallied around Hillary rather than him. And he knows that he, he's furious at Axelrod right now. Uh, but I, I think it was larger than that. I think Joe Biden became convinced and other people told him, you are the one person that can beat Donald Trump. And he is this huge threat to America. Uh, I don't think he was the one person who could, but he won the primaries and he did it very effectively. And I think that had more to do it uh, do with it than any patronizing way he was treated by some Obama people. You know, it's hardly, you know, one thing or the tipping point or something, but I think that there is no doubt that they resent that they feel like They've been looked down on, underappreciated. No one thought we could win. Look at all that we've done. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a I'm Irish myself. Uh, there's just some Irish hard-headedness here at play, I'm sure. Um, and I, I just, what I don't, and of course, I was the same place you were, but I'm thousand percent supportive, but I'm also a thousand percent scared, too. So, was, uh, soldier on here, dude. Let's soldier on. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Gordon. Uh, Scott in Washington, D.C. Ask you, James, why aren't Democrats highlighting the clown car that is the House Republicans operation? <laughs> why aren't Democrats pointing at their inability to organize a two car funeral? <laughs> I think they're doing a pretty good job themselves. You know, that's. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. the whole thing is that, you know, like, I don't know how much more effective they can be in getting the message out, out themselves that they, they cannot govern. It's gotten so bad and so crazy where I'm starting to get to the point where I'm going to defend Mike Johnson. I mean, that's, that, that, I mean, they're beating him up and politically raping the guy. Uh, they're so freaking crazy. And. He, the guy's got a two vote or one vote majority. And what do they think they're going to do? And by the way, if they get, you know, it's always the fire the coach, goddamn fire the coach. Okay, who are you going to hire for the next coach? Well, I thought about that. Well, think about it. it. So I don't think they can get rid of it. 
because I don't think they can elect someone else. It's, it, I think they're in a real crisis. I think the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives is in the, like, I can't, you, you can go back further than me and you know more about Congress. I can't ever remember a caucus in more trouble than they are right now. Nothing like have, this, James. Nothing. No, okay, Nothing well, else. you it's say self, that. It's self-induced. It is yes. self-induced. And when you find people like Ken Buck and Mike Gallagher saying, I'm getting out of this place because it's too goddamn crazy. Uh, these were not uh, uh, rhinos. These were not uh, moderate Republicans. These were serious conservative Republicans. And it, 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 it's being run, you know, it's being run by the insane asylum. I'm telling you, man, it, 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 I just never, it, it what uh, everything is, is how many clicks you get, how much money you raise uh, overnight. And they, and it just encourages the whole thing. And I, it, it's remarkable. I don't, you, you can't run a country like this. I mean, oh. you just can't. And I, it, that nothing shakes them. They lose that that house seat in uh, Long Island, New York, third by eight points. No, no one's watching those kind of districts by eight points. And you know, we always think about our own problem. Problem that Democrats have fears for the country and Trump and by man, they got some problems too. Oh, they, the biggest oh. problem is they're not winning any fucking elections. Right. Absolutely. Jake in Langley, Washington says, how is Putin getting so much leverage over the Republican caucus? If we follow the money, where does it lead? PAC, shell companies run by oligarchs. Jake, your premise is right. I don't know the answer, but it's there for someone to find out. And again, I would encourage all of my colleagues who are still in the investigative news business, there's one hell of a story here. Just keep at it. And 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 by the way, James, there is a myth that sometimes... Uh, the right loves to circulate that, hey, the whole Putin interfering in 2016 was a myth. No, it was not a myth. The dossier was somewhat discredited, but the Senate, Republican Senate Intelligence Committee, among other things, documented. Kathleen Hall Jameson of Pennsylvania documented it. Putin did interfere in 16, and it, I think it clearly helped Trump. I, I, I know it did. And what, but he's done it right in front of you. Got to understand, he wants to bring Paul Manafort back. If that doesn't tell you everything that you want to know, that's all you need to know. So, because they, they don't even need a cutout. They're doing it right in front of you, right in front of you. Understand, this guy went to jail for about every freaking crime you can commit. Was sharing polling with Russian oligarchs. And Putin told Trump, I want Paul Manafort to, I don't, I don't want to go through all these clowns in the middle. I, I want direct access. And Trump, he, and you'll never, ever, ever, ever convince me that there's not some version or something like a P tape somewhere. I just fervently believe that in my bones. Yeah. Phil and Carol together in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. No, Peter Navarro reported to prison to serve time for ignoring a subpoena from Congress to appear before the January 6th committee. Didn't Jim Jordan also ignore a subpoena from Congress? And why isn't Jim Jordan in the slammer? Well, what about Steve Bannon? Well, he's, I mean, he's headed there. He's headed there. Just, it was a different judge. Yeah. You know, I, I guess Congress is reluctant. I have no idea that they fought it, it, they talk about law-abiding citizens. It's flaunt the law every day. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I, I see this coming up with a bishop. And, hey, this guy don't have enough problems of, of Washington, D.C. Says Biden's a cafeteria Catholic. You know, but, but those guys don't know where they are in the world, what people's opinion of them is. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the the, the truth of the matter is, they don't care about the law. And you, when, when you when you say that the January 6th people are hostages, you don't care about the rule of law. When you defy subpoenas, you don't care about the rule of law. Just I've never seen a time in this country where a political party just fronts the law at every juncture that they can 
And then they fucking run on law and order. I mean, you know, his rabbi's been saying for 5,000 years, go figure. Oh, it's true, but those questions were terrific. Please keep them coming. If we didn't get to yours this week, we'll try to get to it next week. Uh, and if we didn't get to them, it's not, don't blame James and me, but we will get to it next week. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Now, following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you'd check out the link to our sponsor, Miracle Made, in our episode show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. And remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.